quick reminder of a point that I've made before. In crisis communication research and practice, the stakeholder perspective is still being developed, yet it's acknowledged as central to an organization's success in managing both issues and crises, as we've been talking about. But the question remains, how do we understand the connections between organizations, issues, and stakeholders in a real-world context? My purpose is to focus on how an organization can map its stakeholders to more effectively prioritize the mutual needs of the organization and its stakeholders within this competitive environment. But we need to make two assumptions about the reality that most organizations face before we go on. First is that no organization has infinite resources. Second, no organization can perfectly meet all the needs of its potential stakeholders at any given time. This is the reality that all organizations face. They must make strategic decisions about how to manage their relationships with different stakeholders who often have radically divergent issues and interests. When I introduced issues management a few podcasts ago, I showed you this picture as a way of referring to the reality that organizational stakeholder environments are busy and complex as organizations have a range of internal and external stakeholder interests that they have to deal with. Not only that, but organizations face multiple layers of stakeholders, meaning that they're trying to simultaneously serve their stakeholders in their own buildings and potentially on the other side of the globe at the same time. If success in issues in crisis management relies on anticipating stakeholders' interests and needs, then simply identifying stakeholders does not provide an organization with actionable intelligence or a way to prioritize stakeholder interest. What's needed is a research-based process that allows an organization to understand its stakeholders and the stakes at any given time, yet is still flexible enough to account for changes in stakeholders and the relationship with the organization. Stakeholder mapping is a way to begin this process. If we map stakeholders or those groups with an interest in the organization's actions, we can better understand the complexity of a particular organization's environment as well as the risks posed by that environment and the changes within it. This process relies on understanding a few well-researched concepts, stakeholder power, legitimacy, relational history, and relational valence which we will discuss in detail. Stakeholder mapping lets us better understand that when we think about stakeholders, we shouldn't be thinking about them in isolation. That in organizations, stakeholders also themselves have stakeholders. This point is quite vital. For example, in a 1998 study of the Zapatista movement in Mexico, Schultz found that their success had less to do with their military strength than it had to do with the strength of the support from individuals and associations that were not explicitly a part of the movement, rather a part of their community. These findings suggest that the organization connections amongst members of a community can be a determining feature in the strength of that community's advocacy for or against an organization. Stakeholder networks are able to facilitate a number of different types of organizational outcomes, so they've been described as vital resources for any organization. So the nature and the quality of the connections between an organization and its stakeholders, as well as the ways in which the organization engages their stakeholders, is likely to influence reactions to emergent issues and crises as well within the organization itself. Therefore, interactions with stakeholders never happen in isolation. Rather, in a web of interactions with stakeholder groups interacting with each other as well as the organization. However, we have to begin somewhere, so let's begin with the organization. An organization should begin by listing all of the stakeholders it knows about. This means due diligence in trying to identify as many stakeholders, both that the organization regularly deals with and not. An effective issues management process will help to generate a good list of stakeholders and provide insights into the relationship with the organization, something that an organization has to understand if it's going to create an effective map of its stakeholders and then try to identify the relationships amongst those stakeholders. Before we can place any stakeholder in relationship to the organization, though, we have to know a few more pieces of information. We have to understand their power, legitimacy, relational history, 
relational valence, and the urgency of their interests. So let's walk through these one at a time. Not surprisingly, one of the first factors that ought to be considered in mapping stakeholders is power. There are many ways to think about power from mutual respect to a Machiavellian notion of forcing someone to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do. However, most of the research on power in organizational contexts focuses on whether stakeholders have direct influence over the organization's decisions. In mapping powerful stakeholders, that is those with greater influence, they would be mapped on the left half and those with less influence on the right half. A stakeholder can be mapped as powerful if it can impose its influence in a couple of primary manners. First is the direct imposition of its will on the organization. Direct imposition of a stakeholder's will can come through a number of mechanisms, such as regulatory compliance or consumer activism like boycotts. For example, in the United States, several Fox News presenters have lost their jobs over the years because consumers targeted the advertisers on their show to pressure the network to withdraw advertising dollars from controversial shows, and it's worked. Alternatively, when negotiating opening stores in Southeast Asia, IKEA has petitioned governments for improved infrastructure, living wages for anyone connected to the improvements, and IKEA not just their own employees, and a few other points related to sustainability and employment conditions. Because of the financial benefits to IKEA's presence in these regions, the authorities have more often than not agreed to IKEA's requests. Likewise, any government can place regulations like taxes, safety, and so on, on organizations as well. These are all examples of what I mean by the direct imposition of a stakeholder's will on an organization that forces compliance. Second, stakeholders can impose their will through utilitarian or practical means. That is to say that stakeholders may influence organizations because it's mutually beneficial if the organization meets the stakeholder's requests. Similarly, many companies form strategic alliances with nonprofit or non-governmental organizations because the nonprofit receives money or visibility from the organization, and the organization's reputation and reach can be improved through the mutually beneficial relationship. This was the case with the Barcelona Football Club in their partnership with UNICEF. Barcelona provided UNICEF with financial support, and by placing UNICEF's name on their jersey, and players like Lionel Messi being spokespersons for the charity. The club demonstrated their goodwill and social responsibility, both win. However, being in that relationship can also mean that organizations are able to influence one another because they're joined by mutual interest and benefit. The next component is legitimacy. This should be thought of as an organization's recognition that the stakeholder group has a viable interest in the operations or action of the organization. Legitimacy does not suggest that the organization likes the stakeholders, rather that they acknowledge that the interest that the stakeholder has in the organization, its actions, and or its advocacy are fair and valid. In mapping legitimacy, those stakeholders who are above the horizontal axis would be viewed as having legitimate interests in the organization, whereas those stakeholders the organization would view as illegitimate would be mapped below the line. Of course, the social and cultural values that ground the organization will influence whether or not stakeholder claims are viewed as legitimate or not. For example, in countries like the Nordic countries or Germany, where labor unions often collaborate with companies, the interest the unions have in the way that the organization treats its employees is likely to be viewed as legitimate. By contrast, in countries like the United States, where trade unions are often viewed as adversarial to corporate objectives, the interest unions have in organizations are much less likely to be viewed as legitimate. But beyond national trends, it's also vital to understand the organizational culture of any organization in order to correctly make the determinations about whether the organization would perceive a stakeholder's interest in that organization as legitimate or not. An organization's ethics and values will therefore provide guidance as to how it will interpret any particular stakeholder's interest in its operations. Next, relationship history asks the simple question of whether or not an organization directly knows a stakeholder. 
Those stakeholders who are known to an organization in this context are those with whom the organization has had direct dealings and interactions like employees, primary consumers, business partners, known regulators, and so on. However, in many cases, organizations may be aware that stakeholders exist, but have no previous dealings with them. And yet in other cases, a stakeholder may have an interest in the organization, but the organization is completely unaware of their existence. So in mapping relational history, the only stakeholders above the line are those known to the organization, that is, those with whom the organization has had dealings and a proper relationship history. Those stakeholders below the line represent those with whom the organization has no pri prior direct dealings and or may not be aware have an interest in the organization. It's certainly in an organization's best interest to at least be aware of as many stakeholders as possible if they're going to be successful at, at being stewards of stakeholder interests. So the issues management and stakeholder mapping process should reduce the number of stakeholders that organizations are completely unaware of, but there will always be some that remain. So if we can think about the way that we use our most public of social media platforms like Instagram or Twitter, this can help make relational history clear. For anyone active on those types of platforms, we'll all have followers that we know personally, our friends, our family, our colleagues. For the most part, these are the people that we interact with the most, and we know how they're going to react to any particular post that we have. Over time, we're also likely to accumulate followers that we've never met. These are people who might like the type of posts or images that we share, topics that we're interested in, and so forth. It's possible that we could get to know these new people over time, or we may really never get to know them, but what can connect us are the mutual interests. In an organizational environment, and not just in social media, there will be people, groups, and organizations that have a connection to our organization, but really have never made themselves specifically known. Yet what's likely to activate different groups without any relational history are particular issues, and especially if a crisis is triggered from those. So that's why relational history is more than just whether a stakeholder is known, but whether a stakeholder has a specific relationship with the organization or not. Organizations also have stakeholders they like and dislike, their friends and their foes. This is where we come back to the distinction that I made earlier with regards to legitimacy. We can recognize a stakeholder's interest as being appropriate based on the organization's mission, but this does not necessarily mean the organization likes the stakeholder. Relational valence then focuses on the degree to which an organization actually likes the stakeholder. In mapping relational valence, those stakeholders that the organization likes, or in this case prefers to build, manage, and or repair relationships with, would be placed above the line, and those stakeholders that the organization would rather not interact with would be below the line. If an organization values a stakeholder, or at least what a positive relationship with that stakeholder offers, then they're going to be much more likely to prioritize interactions with them and attend to that stakeholder's more interests much more willingly than those that they don't value. However, that's not to say that the stakeholders an organization does not like get ignored. In fact, organizations often seek strategic alliances with stakeholders they may not like because of the value that they offer the organization. The adage that we should keep our friends close but our enemies closer is often applied in managing stakeholder relationships. For example, in the oil and gas industry, environmental advocates are probably not the first stakeholder group that most would guess that the industry would like. However, there are an increasing number of projects and partnerships occurring between the two because of mutual interest. So relational valence tells us who an organization's most favored stakeholders are, but not necessarily which stakeholders they will interact with the most. And therein lies the key distinction between legitimacy and valence. Both are important to know in mapping the stakeholders, but these are very different ways to understand an organization's disposition towards the stakeholder. Finally, 
Not all stakeholder interests will be viewed equally at any given time by an organization. The previous characteristics of power, legitimacy, history, and valence capture a snapshot of the nature of the relationship between an organization and its stakeholders at any given point. However, one of the principal differences in an organization's motivation to manage stakeholder interests is in the timeliness of their interests or the urgency. In mapping urgency, those stakeholders with the most important interests, which can be defined based on timeliness, severity of impact on the stakeholder, or severity of impact on the organization, should be mapped closer to an organization, whereas those stakeholders with less urgency can be placed further from the organization. It's also a matter of the organizational ethics, how urgency is prioritized, because it means that when there are competing stakeholder interests, Sometimes organizations cannot accommodate all interests equally. So does an organization define its shareholders as having the most urgency, or its employees, or its consumers as having the most urgency? The mapping process does not predict how an organization will prioritize, but it does indicate that prioritization happens. It's a way of trying to capture it. So in this way, as organizations make strategic choices about resource allocation, urgency can help identify those stakeholders with concerns that are the most important so that their needs can be met first. For example, after any kind of disaster in medical triage, those patients with injuries that are life-threatening are treated first, and so on until those with only minor injuries are treated. This is necessary to ensure that the doctors are able to manage their time in a way that ensures the greatest survival rate. In an organizational environment during issues management, understanding stakeholder urgency is a way to help organizations mitigate or even avoid crises from emerging, and in a crisis environment to prioritize which stakeholder interests have to be managed first for the organization's and the community's best outcomes. Based on this mapping exercise, four categories of stakeholders emerge. Along with this classification comes implications for stakeholder relationship, issue, and crisis management. It's important to note this process is meant to map an organization's stakeholders at a given moment. As such, it allows organizations to document and track their relationships with critical stakeholders across time with additional mapping exercises. The bottom line is that this shouldn't be a one-off exercise, but it should be used as a periodic exercise to yield better intelligence for stakeholder relationship management. Organizations that track and map their stakeholders can also create a simple spreadsheet or database with regular inputs over time so that all aspects of the relationship can be monitored and tracked against the organization's strategic objectives, environment, and issues affecting it. An example of this is in the textbook, but can certainly be modified or customized for an organization's needs. But let's talk about each of the four classifications of stakeholders. First, strategic stakeholders are those with legitimacy, power, and a clear relational history with the organization, but they may not necessarily be liked by an organization. So regardless of the positive or negative valence, these are stakeholders that an organization knows that they must work with in order to achieve their key objectives. For example, a company like Coca-Cola may have a number of stakeholders that they must interact with in order to manage their obligations and achieve their goals, such as their consumers, employees, water conservancy groups, suppliers, and governments. All of these require engagement and management, but not all will get the same amount of attention, nor may all be liked by Coca-Cola. Yet, depending on the situation and requirements, they're all likely to contribute to Coca-Cola's overall success. Next, desirable stakeholders are those the organization likes and believe have legitimate interests in the business, but may not have direct relational history. However, there are also stakeholders who lack direct power over the organization. By identifying what desirable stakeholders care about and how an organization might be able to support the stakeholders' interests in a way that's aligned with the organization's priorities and goals, can create strategic opportunities for organizations. This alignment of interests between organizations and desirable stakeholders often represents social responsibility initiatives taken on by organizations, 
For example, Nando's is a popular restaurant chain in the UK, but it was founded in South Africa and has outlets in 35 different countries. It supports a number of charitable endeavors like reducing malaria and reducing waste that target support for the communities in South Africa and other developing nations. This certainly represents an opportunity for the company to improve its reputation, but also to build relationships with the communities that it sources its ingredients like its chilies from that extends beyond just a formal business relationship. Nando's may not have a strong relationship history with each of these groups, but they are readily identifiable. Third, moral stakeholders are, by definition, those that an organization does not explicitly have a relationship with and whose concerns are not viewed as legitimate, often because they may not be clear or well-defined. We can typically think about these broadly as the general public. Moral stakeholders may not be relevant nor activated until an issue or crisis emerges to which they're connected. At this point, the organization may not be aware of them. However, these stakeholders are likely aware of the organization. While these may not be stakeholders that are segmented and known by an organization, organizations are still likely to communicate with them indirectly through advertising, social media, and networks of relationships with their own better known stakeholders. In the social media age, the proportion of moral stakeholders has probably shrunk because organizations can better define and segment its publics into other categories, especially the desirable stakeholders with whom the organization simply has no pre-existing relationship. Despite this, it still remains an important conceptual group because the way that an organization regards the public can provide important information about the organization's values and approach it may take when managing crises that emerge. Dangerous stakeholders are the final and sometimes most interesting stakeholder group. These are the groups that have power but are most definitely not liked by the organization, nor their interest in the organization defined as legitimate by the organization. It's also very possible that an organization may not have a clearly defined relational history with all of the groups who could affect or influence them. One of the critical functions of issues management and risk assessment is to identify groups and issues that could affect the organization and plan for those groups' needs and issues if they become triggered. As a risk mitigation exercise, understanding an organization's greatest threats is vital if it's to mitigate or at least minimize the impact of emergent issues and crises. In the end, the purpose of introducing this material is to provide a practical tool for organizations to more purposefully consider the relationship between itself and its stakeholders. However, the visual map itself also helps organizations to begin to think about the connections and potential interrelationships between stakeholders themselves. It's a very practical tool to help organizations begin to make more purposeful and strategic decisions about managing complex organizational environments that connects the issues management process to stakeholder relationship management.